Booga! The reason I'm able to make that sound is because of my respiratory system. Let's talk about how exactly. The nose, the pharynx. Pharynx is the back of your throat. Larynx in your neck, that's your, where your voice box is. Uh, also makes up your Adam's apple because of your thyroid cartilage. Your trachea, the tube that goes down into your lungs. I didn't just push record off. Okay. Uh, the bronchi that branches off into the lungs, and then the lungs and the alveoli, the little grape thingies. Okay, what's the function? Gas exchange between the blood and the environment. Uh, this happens in the alveoli within the lungs, and they also help to warm, purify, and humidify the incoming air. The nose itself is externally visible. It's definitely externally visible on me, and as I age, it's only going to get bigger. Yes! Air enters through the nose, through the nares, the external nares. These are the nostrils. Uh, and then there is a nasal septum, which divides it into two. I didn't grow up uh, snorting cocaine, so I still have an actual septum that separates left and right, um, as opposed to one giant uh, internal cavity. Um, so here's the nose and all the various spaces, um, and the palates and so on. You'll hear a lot of the, the structures named as we go through and talk about various things, so you may want to refer back to this at various points uh, to understand. So on the top, as you know, are the olfactory receptors located in the mucosa, the actual um, uh, stuff where the, the, the smells, the chemicals dissolve into, and you have your sensory receptors there on the superior surface. Uh, and then the rest is lined just with plain old respiratory mucosa. Uh, it also helps to moisten the air, and then it traps incoming particles to help make lovely boogers. Uh, on the side walls of your nose, there's also things called con conche, and these help to increase the turbulence of the air to move it all around to help smell it um, uh, and to increase the surface area uh, as well. And then you have the hard palate on the bottom and then the soft palate as well uh, in the back on the bottom between the nose and the mouth. So hard palates in the front, top of the mouth, and soft palates in the back, which would be the bottom of the nose. It separates the, the nose and the mouth. Uh, you have sinuses, of course. Uh, throughout the brain, these sinuses are empty spaces or uh, holes. There's the, a sinus in the frontal bone, there's a sinus in the sphenoid bone, one in the ethmoid bone, and one in the maxillary bone. And these sinuses, more importantly, help to lighten the skull because we have a big skull, it would be hard to lift, especially my big skull. Uh, and they also act for resonance chambers uh, for speech, which helps to make us beautiful singers. Uh, and then there's mucus that drains into the nasal cavity through there. Um, so into the throat, we have the pharynx at the back of the mouth. This is where the nose and the mouth are connected. The three regions, we have the nasopharynx, which is the most superior region. It's directly behind the nose. The oropharynx is in the middle region just behind the mouth. And then the, laryngo the laryngopharynx uh, is the region that's attached to the larynx itself uh, at the bottom. So it connects the pharynx and the larynx, essentially. Um, and just so you know, the oropharynx and laryngopharynx are common pass passageways for air and food. They both go through... Uh, those structures. And the nasopharynx, of course, there is no food going through unless uh, a gummy bear happens to make its way up your nose for some reason. Auditory tubes go into the nasopharynx, of course, and then you have your tonsils that are part of the pharynx in the back there. Um, all different kinds of tonsils that the names are not important, but various tonsils for immune system function. The larynx is your voice box. Uh, air and food go through here, and it plays a role in speech. Uh, there's uh, eight rigid hyaline cartilage uh, there's spoon-shaped flap uh, and a spoon-shaped flap that's called the epiglottis. So that cartilage uh, is lining your trachea. You can feel it on your neck, these little protrusions. Uh, that's hyaline cartilage there for protection. And then the voice box itself is not the epiglottis. It's separate. Um, but the epiglottis is the flap of tissue that determines whether stuff is going to go down the uh, trachea into the lungs or down the esophagus into the stomach because the tube up at the top is the same for both. Um, now, here you have the thyroid cartilage, which sticks out to make what we call our Adam's apple, and this is only in men because of the size, and this is larger, so a man's voice box is larger, which makes his, the sound deeper, um, or a lower frequency. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. Um, so only a man has that, at least typically you're not supposed to see a woman with a protruding uh, Adam's apple or a protruding thyroid cartilage, because then she'd have a very low voice and we'd have other questions. Uh, the epiglottis is the opening at the top of the larynx going up into the, into the uh, pharynx, of course. And then uh, it routes foods to the larynx and air towards the... Um, food to the larynx and air toward the trachea, of course. And then you have your vocal cords. Vocal cords vibrate as air from your lungs is, ex is expelled out your mouth. The vocal cords vibrate, and that's how you create sound. It vibrates the air, and then that vibrating air gets into the ears, and that causes vibrations, and you know that whole scenario. 
Now your vocal cords do something cool because air is passing through and your vocal cords are flapping. You can manipulate the way your voice sounds by manipulating your larynx. And the good news is it's not very well attached. So you can move it around and I'm not doing anything special with my voice but moving around my voice box, my larynx. And so you can call someone on the phone and do a crank call like this. I didn't really tell you that. And they won't really know who's calling. Instead of using those electronic things, you can say, hi, my name is Frankie. And there you go. The epiglottis is the opening between the vocal cords, that actual little teeny, not epiglottis. The glottis is the opening. The epiglottis covers the glottis, as you might imagine, epi on top. Uh, the trachea is the actual windpipe, connects the larynx to the bronchi, uh, left and right. Uh, and it's lined with mucosa that are ciliated and they beat continuously as air comes in this way, they beat to, to take things back up the opposite direction to catch uh, foreign particles and expel things so you don't get dust and debris inside your lungs, which would be bad, of course. Um, and we already mentioned that they're lined with this C-shaped hyaline cartilage. Primary bronchi are, are when the trachea divides um, and then the right bronchus is actually sh wider and shorter than uh, and straighter than the left and this is because of the distance it has to travel based on where the heart is. Um, and then the bronchi divide and divide and divide into bronchioles and so on, um, eventually making their way in as to, um, into alveoli. Uh, now the lungs take up most of the thoracic cavity. They're pretty large. Uh, and the apex is all the way at the top by the clavicle, all the way up here your lungs go to. And the base rests on the diaphragm all the way down here. And each lung is divided. The left lung only has two lobes. It's actually less. The right lung has three lobes. I suggest you know why. The left lung heart sticking in that way. Uh, hint, hint. Uh, so here you see a uh, 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 cross-section, transverse cross-section here, uh, the, uh, the pulmonary trunk going left and right from the pulmonary artery. This is the heart being shown here and you see it branching. Here you see left and right bronchi, uh, that tube right there that's also covered in, in uh, cartilage and so on. Um, okay, the lungs are covered with a gooey, mucousy substance. This is the, uh, the pulmonary pleura that covers the lung surface. And then you have uh, the parietal pleura on top of that that actually lines the thoracic cavity. So on the inside of your ribs, you have this uh, uh, lining called the parietal pleura. Over your lungs, you have the pulmonary pleura or visceral pleura. And then in between them, you have pleural fluid. And this helps the, the gliding and the opening and closing of your lungs so they don't get stuck on stuff. They need to be smooth and gooey. Um, and we already talked about this. At the end of bronchioles, you see here these little grape-like structures called alveoli that we already mentioned. Uh, they're very small, uh, but they do have uh, um, some reinforcing cartilage for support. And they're very, very thin-walled. And this is important that these alveoli are very thin-walled because this is a site of gas exchange, okay? It's a uh, squamous epithelium that lines these. And uh, they cover the, there's also capillaries if this, excuse me, if this is the alveolus is singular, uh, then capillaries wrap around this so the gas exchange can occur between the blood and the air. And so here you see that. Here's a capillary uh, shown here with a red blood cell, and here's the alveoli, and you see oxygen and CO2 passing back and forth. Oxygen going into the blood, CO2 into the uh, airway, into the alveoli, of course. And you can, hear, you can see some other things here as well, um, such as a surfactant secreting cell. Surfactants are important, kind of like in soap, they help to, uh, they create a, a polar surface and help to pull the lungs out. So it aids in inflating the lungs. And this is in fact why babies who are born too early um, often have to stay in the hospital for a while because they haven't produced surfactant yet. And thus they can't breathe very well because they can't inflate their lungs. It's difficult to, to pull with that negative pressure. Uh, maybe we'll have to talk about that a bit in class. And uh, so they have to wait till they develop enough that they produce enough surfactant to allow the lungs to inflate. Gas exchange occurs by diffusion. We already mentioned that. There's also macrophages here shown uh, for protection. These uh, white things are macrophages to check the incoming uh, things. Uh, and then surfactant, as I mentioned, uh, line the alveolar surfaces to help uh, enlarge them, uh, the lungs specifically. Pulmonary ventilation is moving air in and out. External respiration is the gas exchange between the blood and the alveoli. So let's talk about how this works. Um, the, the gases are moved around through the bloodstream, and then the internal respiration is moving those gases into the tissue cells from the blood, of course. Now, how does this thing work? Ventilation itself. It's all based on volume changes, okay, and how that affects pressure changes. When you increase the volume, okay, that affects pressure. When you decrease the volume, that, that directly affects pressure. And thus, 
pressure causes the changes in these things. So there's two phases. There's inspiration means go air going in, and expiration means air going out. Inspiration occurs, so the diaphragm sits like this in your chest at rest. When you inspire, you flex the diaphragm down, which makes the volume in your chest cavity larger. Increased volume in the chest cavity means decreased pressure. And when the pressure inside my chest is lower, it's now much lower than the pressure outside in the atmosphere. And that's going to suck air like a vacuum into my lungs. Okay? Again, volume increase, pressure decrease, which is now lower than the uh, atmospheric pressure that draws air in. Okay? This is inspiration. And you see that here in a diagram. I also showed it with uh, my fingers. Exhalation or expiration is a passive process. You can do forced expiration, but it's not essential. It happens passively. You don't flex muscles to do so. You relax muscles. Forced expiration is by flexing your abdominal muscles to squeeze on the, uh, the lungs. Um, and also the uh, intercostal muscles as well that will depress the rib cage. So exhalation works by relaxing the diaphragm, so the diaphragm goes back to this, that shrinks the volume here in the space, in the thoracic cavity. Shrinking volume means increase of pressure, now higher pressure in my chest than the atmosphere, and thus air gets pushed out. So it's larger the diaphragm. There's also muscles in between the ribs that help to expand your chest and to lower your chest. When you expand the chest, you further help to increase the volume, and this is important that the ribs are connected to the sternum by cartilage that's a little bit stretchy so that you can do this. Um, so exhalation is by relaxing the intercostal muscles and relaxing the diaphragm to shrink the space in here, increase the pressure, and push the air out. That's exhalation or expiration. Uh, so there's a, a, just a natural pressure difference, a normal pressure difference. And the pleural space is actually negative. There's a lack of substances. It's um, which creates that suctioning effect and is aided by the surfactant. Um, and the differences in lung and pleural space pressures keep the lungs from collapsing. If there's no difference in pressure, then the lungs are going to collapse and you won't be able to inflate them. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, there are occasional non-respiratory air movements, such as a <coughs> or 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 a Hiccup. All those are movements of air back and forth. They may make various sounds because they affect your vocal thoughts, um, but that's non-respiratory. Air movement. Volumes and capacities. Last topic. Normal breathing moves in, about, in and out about 500 milliliters of air. We call this your tidal volume. Lots of things affect your tidal volume, such as how big you are, what sex you are, which directly ties to some other things, uh, how old you are, what physical condition you're in, do you smoke and various things. Uh, now, residual air volume is after you exhale, there's still about 1,200 milliliters of air that remains in your lungs. You don't push all that out. Now, you can if you choose, if you exhale, you can push that extra out. Hold on, I'm lightheaded. Okay, you can push that extra out. That's your residual volume, okay? You have an inspiratory reserve volume. That's the amount of air that you can forcibly take in beyond your tidal volume. So tidal volume, again, is about 500 mils of air. I can take in more, and this is on the order of 21 to, to 3,200 milliliters of air additionally. And then you have expiratory reserve volume, which is that uh, air that can be forcibly exhaled. That's about 1,200 milliliters. Um, and then your residual volume is anything that remains in your lungs after uh, expiration, as I already mentioned. That's about 1,200 milliliters. Okay? Now, all these values together make up your vital capacity, how much air you're able to take in and out the total amount of exchangeable air. So your vital capacity is equal to the tidal volume plus the inspiratory reserve volume plus the, plus the expiratory reserve volume. Now, one thing that we're not factoring is what we call the dead space volume. Every time you breathe in, there's air that stays in your trachea that doesn't make it all the way down into your alveoli to do gas exchange. And by the time you exhale, it doesn't get all the way down. It ends up going back out. It's about 150 milliliters, a small amount. And we call this dead space volume. It only stays in the conducting zone, the in and out. It never makes it to the gas exchange zone of the alveoli. Um, the actual air that does, we call this the functional volume, the air that actually reaches the zone. So that's about 350 mils of your 500 mil tidal volume. And we can measure these with a spirometer. We have them in back. We could do that if we had time. And this is all together in this chart that you can see. Uh, normal tidal volume in and out that you see in this yellow. Expiratory reserve volume, how much you can uh, forcibly exhale. 
residual volume that remains behind even after that amount that you can forcibly exhale and the amount that you can forcibly inhale. All this together makes up your vital capacity. Notice residual volume does not make up vital capacity. You don't have the ability to move that in and out, but your total lung capacity does incorporate that residual volume. And on that note, I'm out. Go take a few breaths. <laughs>